what we're going to do here is we're going to revisit one of the cost tables that we looked at when we were talking about cure competition. And we're going to start at the same place. We're talking about there's a pure competition or perfectly competitive market. And this cost table represents what's happening with one firm, but there are a hundred small firms all producing exactly the same thing in this market. We filled out the cost table. We graphed the marginal cost, average total cost, and the average variable cost for one of these small firms. And then we answered all kinds of questions about, in a pure competition framework, what would these firms do at different prices? So if the price was 18, we said that they would shut down because the shutdown price is $18.33 when you're looking at a pure competition firm. And the break-even price is $30. So what we saw is that each of these 100 little firms at a price of $36 would want to produce 7 units and that each of the 100 firms would have a total revenue of 252, total costs of 216, which we find here in the table, and a profit of $36. But then we drew the supply curve. If there are 100 little firms, and each little firm is following the rule that we're going to ignore the downward sloping portion of marginal cost, in this case where it goes from 30 down to 10, we can see that on the graph here. So ignoring the downward sloping portion of the marginal cost curve, then a pure competition firm is going to keep producing as long as the market price is greater than or equal to their marginal cost of producing. And so we saw that at that price of 36, they would want to produce seven units. But assuming there are 100 firms and they all keep producing as long as price is greater than or equal to marginal cost, we can draw the market supply curve by saying, well, if we know that if the market price is 50, that each firm would want to produce 10 units, then if there were 100 firms in the market, then altogether, the 100 firms would produce 10 times 100 units or 1,000 units. And we drew this market supply curve using that logic. Here's a quantity of 1,000 units. Here's a price of 50. And so that gives us a point on the market supply curve here of 1,000 units at $50. And then by working our way down the marginal cost curve, just adding points, we continued drawing points on the supply curve but then we stopped when we got down to the shutdown price of $18.33 here. Because if all firms shut down at a price below $18.33, you don't want to keep drawing that supply curve down here. We want to say, at any price below $18.33, there's going to be a zero quantity supplied in the market. And that's what this little orange part of the supply curve over here represents. But today we're talking about monopolies. So here is the scenario that we want to analyze. Suppose a monopolist, suppose someone with a lot of money said, hey, what we just saw here was that if we draw this supply curve and we see where it intersects this demand curve, that the market price is $26. And that $26 we saw is below the shutdown price of $30 here, the minimum average total cost. And so all of these firms are losing money. So that's what we saw in our last video when we were looking at this table. So suppose someone with a lot of money, some kind of investor says, hey, I see an opportunity here. All of these firms are losing money. All of these firms are probably looking to exit this industry permanently because they're losing money today. So what if I could somehow contact all 100 firms and make them an offer? Hey, I'll buy your firm from you. I'll take it off your hands. So I'll take all of your land and your labor and your capital. And I will act as the entrepreneur. But if I own all 100 firms, that will make me a monopolist. So let's see what would change in this market if, instead of having 100 pure competition firms, what if we change this to where we're looking at one monopolist who owns all of those hundred firms. Let's analyze exactly what would change when we're looking at this market supply and demand curve over here. So what we're going to assume is that when the monopolist buys the 100 firms, that the monopolist's 
marginal cost of production is going to be the same, that the cost curves are going to look just the same. It's just now the monopolist owns all 100 firms. Or alternatively, we could assume that these 100 firms have banded together to organize and to help each other, and they formed a cartel. Remember, a cartel is when a lot of little firms get together and act as if they're a monopolist. And the, what a monopolist always wants to do is reduce the quantity produced so that they can jack the price up. So what is this monopolist going to do? Well, the first thing we want to do when we're talking about a monopolist is monopolists do not have supply curves. So we're going to cross out the word supply. Remember, a supply curve tells us for each market price what quantity would be supplied in the market. Well, there is no market price when you're talking about a monopolist. They're a price maker, so it's whatever price they want it to be. So we relabel this curve, this red line, marginal cost. However, there's something we need to fix. Down here, we were plotting marginal cost all the way down, but then when we got down to the shutdown price, we stopped graphing those marginal costs. If I'm a monopolist, the rule is keep producing as long as marginal revenue is greater than or equal to marginal cost, and then charge the price, the highest price that we find up on the demand curve, the highest price that people would be willing to pay for that quantity. So while the shutdown price is relevant to a monopolist, if the best price they could possibly charge was lower than 1833, even a monopolist wouldn't bother. However, this shutdown point right here is not relevant. And the reason why it's not relevant is because when a monopolist sees where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, they don't charge a price down here that's equal to marginal cost they charge a price up here on the demand curve, the highest price they can. Let's see how this works. So let's draw the marginal revenue curve. You remember how to do that. If the demand is a straight line, like this one is, then marginal revenue is also a straight line, but it has twice the slope. So what we want to do is draw a marginal revenue curve that starts here at $50 in a quantity of zero, and it goes down twice as fast. So this demand, it looks like it intersects here a little bit higher than 1,000. Let's call it about halfway between 1,000 and 1,100, about 1,050. So what that means is if the marginal revenue curve we're going to draw goes down twice as fast, that the marginal revenue curve is going to intersect down here at about 525. just whatever half that quantity is where the demand curve hits. So let's draw that line. So this line tells us how much additional revenue, marginal revenue, this monopolist would bring in every time they sell one more unit. But here's the problem. We can't see where marginal revenue hits the marginal cost curve because this little green line does not represent their marginal cost the little green line is going to the shutdown price. So what we have to do in order to see what this monopolist needs to do is continue drawing marginal costs down. So let me add some of those. So this one is a marginal cost of $19 at 4 times 100 or 400 units. So let's draw that next marginal cost here, $15 three units, but if the monopolist owns a hundred little firms, that's going to be 300. So $15, 300 units. All right, well, that's really as far as we need to carry that marginal cost down, but let's add the last couple of points just to be complete here. So let's see, two units, $10, okay, 200, $10. And we could add that first one there, marginal cost of 30, if we wanted to, right? But that's not going to be relevant here. So remember, the monopolist is going to continue to produce as long as this pinkish-purple marginal revenue is greater than or equal to the red marginal cost curve, and then they're going to stop producing. And so what we want to do is just see approximately where does it look like that is happening. 
right about there. And then what the monopolist does is it looks down at the quantity axis to see how many units is that. And we just want to get a good approximate value. We're not going to be able to tell exactly how many that is, but to me it looks like it's about halfway between 300 and 400, so I'm going to call it about 350. All right, so the monopolist quantity, we'll call that QM, looks like it's about 350 units. Now what price do they want to charge for the 350 units? It's not this price over here. That's the marginal cost. That's the marginal revenue. The monopolist wants to charge the highest price they can, and what they're going to do is look up, 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 up at the demand curve, and that will tell them the highest price they can charge for 350 units. And it's always going to be a price higher than what the pure competition firms would be charging. Remember here, where the supply curve and the demand curve intersected was at a price of 26. The monopolist is not going to charge less than $26. So we look up here, and that looks to me like it's about $33. So that would be the monopolist's price, about $33. So that's what changes when you're looking at a monopolist. Let's just run through a list of what we had to do here. Since the monopolist keeps producing as long as marginal revenue, the additional revenue coming in is bigger than or equal to the marginal cost, first we have to draw the marginal revenue line, which is a line twice as steep as the demand, as long as demand is a straight line. And in this class, we're always going to use straight line demand curves. So if they look at where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, that's the second step. And if we need to draw additional points to represent the marginal cost, because the monopolist is not really going to be bound by this shutdown price, because their price they're charging is not down here in this area. It's up here on the demand curve, right? So if we need to fill in some marginal costs, do so, so we can see where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. And then we look down at the quantity axis to see how much to produce, to see when to stop producing. And then we look up at the demand curve to find what price they should charge. And then one big thing we always want to try to do when we're looking at a monopolist is to calculate an estimate of the dead weight loss that's going to be created by this monopolist taking over this market. It's a huge consideration. Whenever firms want to merge, one of the things that we try to do, we try to advise the government on as economists, is how much harm this is going to cause to society. And this dead weight loss is one of the biggest measures of the harm. So what we want to do is highlight this dead weight loss. And it's not exactly a triangle, but remember, everything we're doing here in this graph on the right-hand side is an approximate answer. And remember why that is, because when we draw the supply curve, or in this case, the marginal cost curve, it's kind of a strong assumption to assume that there were exactly 100 firms and that all of these 100 firms had exactly the same cost structure as the one we're looking at over here on the left. So everything over here is approximate. We don't want to be sloppy. We want to get as close as we can but we don't want to obsess over thinking we can find the one perfect answer. We just want a reasonable answer. So if we wanted to estimate the area of this orange thing, again, it's not exactly a triangle, but we're going to approximate it as if it was exactly a triangle, because we're getting a, an approximate answer here. Then we would say, okay, this dead weight loss triangle is squiggly equals, approximately equal to one half, times. All right, let's look at the base. And to me, I like to think about the base as being this right here, this purple line. And that base looks like it goes from $33 down to 15, 16, 17, about $17. So that base goes from about 33 down to about 17. So 33 minus 17 is $16. So we're going to call that one half times 16. 
times, and then the height of that triangle goes from that base up to the highest point. And that height really is the difference in the quantity. It's the difference in the quantity the monopolist is producing, the 350, up to the quantity that the purely competitive market would have produced. And we said before, yeah, that looks like it's around 500 units. So the height is going to be 500 minus 350, or about 150. All right, so 1 half times 16 times 150 gives us an approximate deadweight loss of about $1,200. And this deadweight loss is just the loss in total surplus because the monopolist is not going to produce as much as a purely competitive industry would. So again, when you compare how much total surplus there is in a purely competitive industry to that of a monopoly, there's always going to be less total surplus. The monopoly's goal is always to reduce the quantity they produce and increase the price. And when we just visually compare the total surplus here, let me just outline this in pink. And again, this is approximate, right? Because we're not doing the exact marginal cost here. We're just kind of assuming that this is somewhat like a triangle. In a purely competitive industry, the total surplus would be approximately this pink plus the orange highlighted area. But then after the monopoly takes over, we're going to be left with only the pink area. And so dead weight loss is the reduction in the total surplus. So that's the big thing that changes when you're looking at a monopoly compared to a purely competitive industry when you're analyzing cost tables. And this is a good method to get an approximate idea of how much a market would be harmed if we allowed all the firms to form a cartel. And this is one reason why cartels are illegal in most countries. So if you have any questions about this, please let me know. I'll be happy to try to answer your questions. This is Dr. Berkey signing out. I wish you the best of luck. And I hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.